start these evenings with what the Buddha means to me um, before we actually, you know, sort of focus on the Buddha himself. We wanted to look more personally at what the Buddha means to me. So, yeah, thank you very much, the three of you. Really lovely to hear um, your talks. In fact, we've had those talks all the way through the week. Um, Oscar gave one last night. He's in the team tonight. Uh, Harvey gave one the first night. You'll be seeing a little bit of Harvey, hopefully, later on. And Ruby gave one as well, and uh, she's on our team as well, so uh, really good. So we've been trying to explore the, the four great turning points of the Buddha's life. And first of all, we talked about um, the four sites and the leaving the palace. And then we talked about the whole story going up to the rose apple tree, which the rose apple tree seems to me to be a, a massive turning point in the Buddha's life. Um, in that we're putting these films onto YouTube as well, they're just the talks. And uh, I thought we should call that the Buddha's failure because one of the things that he learned is to admit failure, is to admit that you've put your energy into something, even a lot of energy into something that isn't helping you, um, that is actually harming you. And many of us have done that in our life, haven't we, in one way or another, put a lot of energy, a lot of time, and a lot of money into something that actually harms us, but we are sort of trapped by an ideology that thinks it helps, yeah? that believes it's helped. And even and that ideology that makes you believe it helps um, can carry you on into some very, very dangerous places. People drink for those reasons, people do all sorts of things with a kind of belief that it is actually what you should do. Yeah? Uh, so I call that the Buddha's failure. And then last night, the greatest turning point of the Buddha's life is the Buddha's enlightenment. And tonight we come to what I'm imagining is a fourth and final turning point, at least the last we know, which is the Buddha's parinirvana. Um, we would usually say the Buddha's death, but it's, it's not really quite that. And my task this evening, um, if I can, is to try to say something about what, what parinirvana is, um, what, what death is. Of course, I don't know uh, what happens w when you die, and you don't know what happens when you die. Nobody knows what happens when you die. Um, the priest, the rabbi, um, the psychologist, uh, the philosopher, the Buddhist, whoever else, nobody knows what happens when you die. Yeah? Uh, but I'm going to try to talk about at least the mystery of death. Yeah? And I wanted to start... Uh, more personally, um, I wanted to start with my father's death. Uh, partly it's come back into my mind uh, because just the other night I dreamt about my father again. Um, I used to dream about him a lot. I've written about my father a lot. Um, my relationship with my father was very um, troubled when I was young. Um, I experienced him as distant and... Uh, Aggressive, and at least he, had, he could have a terrible temper. He was also a very good man, but I was um, the fourth uh, boy. I've got a younger sister as well. Um, so my father always seemed a distant and rather aggressive and frightening man. But as, and I, I sort of distanced myself from him and very much identify with my mother and my sister against my brothers and against my father. Um, I sort of took their part against my father, really. Um, but when I got involved in uh, Buddhism, which was now about 34 years ago, the first thing I noticed that changed, actually, I couldn't meditate for toffee. <laughs> I used to cycle from my squat in Brixton, arrive here in the main shrine of the London Buddhist Centre, and immediately fall asleep. <laughs> and then I'd wake up at the tea break, go back, think, come on, we can do it, we can do it, and I'd fall asleep again. And that happened for about two years. I was in a very bad state when I first arrived. I was either kind of manic or actually really quite depressed. Uh, really looking back on it, I think I was first depressed when I was about 13. Uh, in fact, I remember feeling suicidal when I was 13. Um, but uh, so my relate, but what the first thing that happened when I, when I sort of started coming along, actually quite quickly coming along to the Buddhist Center and meditating and making friends here and receive, experiencing a lot of kindness here from people right from the very beginning and welcoming was that my relationship with my parents started to change and my relationship with my father started to change. So um, I used, he used to be in the shed all the time and I 
used to do. So I used to, I just started going in and sitting with him with him in the shed and just talking to him. He's, 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 my father's a sort of sort of really. He's only two years older than my maternal grandfather. So he's much much. He's, he's, he was forty years older than my mother. So you know, I my father always seemed old to me. Um, you know, he he was in the war in Burma, for instance. So I grew up with war stories. I'm probably one of the last generation that grows up with stories of the war, that you first-hand stories of the war. And I, I find that very dangerous because, you know, I, I grow up with it as a reality, the war, even if it's through the stories of my father. It's very, very different to listening to histories. Um, and if we're not careful, if you stop, if you stop hearing stories about war, you start to forget what war is. And when you start to forget what war is, you start to create a new one if you're not careful. Um, anyway, my, my, my relationship with my father improved really very dramatically once I got involved in the Dharma. I, all, all that happened really, frankly, good heavens, is I worked well, with my mother and my father, but I, I just took an interest in him. Um, I, I stopped being a, a, a petulant teenager. I was a petulant teenager into my 20s. And nowadays, people are managing it into their 30s. Um, um, but yeah, I stopped being a petulant teenager and thinking how dreadful they all were to me and just got to know him and took an interest in him. Um, I remember at one time, he would start reciting something by Shelley and I'd managed to continue it, you know, because we were both reading Shelley. At the time. Uh, or he'd read Shelley as a young man and I was starting to read Shelley. Then. So um, I remember him going to, into hospital and... Um, he was trying to find a girlfriend <laughs> for me in hospital, uh, which is, if you, anyone who knows me, not, that's not going to work. Um, <laughs> um, he, I think he was in denial. Anyway, um, he was trying to get all of my brothers and I married off in the last few moments. All of my brothers had got divorced. And he was trying to fix us all up with nurses. Um, anyway, he didn't manage it with me. Um, it was beyond his powers. But um, So uh, what were the things about Dying, it's, it's, it's not a straightforward matter. You, it's not that someone gets worse and worse and worse and then they die. You know, sometimes he was, he was well and sometimes he wasn't well. And I remember him being in hospital, um, the shock of seeing my father in bed. You know, I've never, you know, it's, that, that was really serious seeing my father in bed. And then um, I remember particularly him coming back to the house, this very old house that we live in in this small town. And um, he had this terrible expression on his face, which I'd never seen, which was this expression of, oh, it's, it's not going to get better. You know, he'd really, as soon as he was in the hospital, he wanted to come home. And we were talking about how we'd get his bed into the lounge and we'd put these, you know, we, can, we could manage all that and we'd do this list so he could pull himself up. And, and I think in his mind, he thought, all I need to do is I go home and I'll feel better. You know, as soon as he got home, he didn't feel better. And it was like in that moment that um, he knew he was dying. Um, and I'm very English. I come from a very English background. And, you know, so I've never hugged my father. That would be unthinkable uh, in, my, in my, you know, it would actually upset, frighten him more than anything. Uh, he was a very emotional man, but hugging people doesn't mean, to, wouldn't have meant anything to him. I remember shaking his hand. He had these her hands that are very like mine, huh? um, and have this very lovely sort of war dry, warm handshake. And I remember saying, I'm going to, I need to go off on a weekend retreat now, Dad, I'm going to have to go. Um, and trying to put all the love that I felt for him in that handshake. Um, actually, I, I, I feel that my relationship with my father continued and still continues after his death. So yeah, I just dreamt about him just the other night. And it's very unusual because I haven't dreamt about him for a while. And then I got a phone call from my mother, who's very elderly, um, and a phone call early in the morning, which is okay, very, very unusual from her. And that rather worried me. So I answered it. And she said, oh, have you been trying to phone me? Because I've had these missed calls since seven in the morning. And I said, no, no, I haven't been trying to phone you. She said, oh, it's, 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 it's the 25th anniversary of your dad's death today, which I hadn't remembered. But there I had, I was just dreaming about him. Um, which makes you wonder, all of those things, and we've all had experiences like that. I was talking to a friend of mine recently, his grandmother died, and his grandmother's sister uh, appeared in a dream and said that they'd come to collect her. You know, um, and they've got a, a strong spiritualist 
as there was a lot in the East End, a sort of spiritualist tradition. Um, so all those sort of little experiences like that make, they make you wonder again about time, that we don't understand time. Um, we, we, we've got this clock time, but we don't understand what time is. Perhaps it folds in on itself so that 25 years he's there again. Anyway, I had this dream about him. And um, I was on a weekend retreat, and I got that terrible phone call that I was dreading, you know, uh, look, I think we think he is going to die. Um, I'd been traveling back and forward from the London. I was living here, here then, obviously, and ordained then, and traveling back and forward. Um, uh, so I came back, and um, I was, uh, you know, as always the case in these kind, you know, I was terrible, I, I felt terribly frightened in a way that's very difficult to express. I was like frightened out of my wits. I remember buying a packet of cigarette, which is unusual because I don't smoke. <laughs> <laughs> and I was, I was a Buddhist order member and I should have known better. But anyway, I, there I was smoking cigarettes. I, I don't recommend that. And that, that's not a Buddhist teaching. Um, uh, all it does is make you sort of giddy and a bit sick. Anyway, um, and then I went and then I stopped. We had to stop at this awful station somewhere. And I rang my brother this, from a phone box, I remember. And, and he just, my father had just died, and my brother was in tears, and I'd never heard my brother's brother in tears before. He just, he, my father had just died, so there I was in this horrible um, train station in the middle of nowhere, and my brother just telling me my dad had just died. Um, and me in this sort of state of uh, yeah, fear and stuff. Anyway, so I went, I went, carried on my journey, my brother, one of my brothers picked me up at the station, and I, I went back, and my father was... Um, Still in, in, in the bed in the in, in the our lounge, um, and um, I sat with him for. I was just sort of sitting there. My family were. I got a very large family. My family were around. There was a very very poignant moment when the, the undertakers came to take my father's body away, and we shooed our, um, one of my two of our nephews into the other room. Um, Tom and Ben. They were only little boys at the time, and. Uh, when they came back in, my, you know, dad had gone, and uh, Tom just said, where's grandpa gone? You know, like, he didn't realize it, you know, and suddenly he just wasn't there. Anyway, I, me I remember sitting with my father um, in, in that time, in that short time, too short time, between his death when I arrived and, and um, the undertaker's arrived. And, uh, you know, I... By then, I'd been a Buddhist for however long, 20 years. I don't know, I don't know good sums. Um, I'd, done, I'd, I'd been a Buddhist for a long time. But in those moments, any kind of ideology, any kind of theory, any kind of um, pre-cooked idea just disappears. Um, and you're left, you're left with reality, which is, after all, what Buddhism is trying to move you towards. Uh, it's a raft that moves you to the other side of, uh, of, the, of the stream. It, it, it's a raft to take you to reality. And here was reality uh, in front of me uh, that my, my father was dead. Um, and um, I had this m moment, a moment, as it were, out of time, um, where I really, I just didn't know, I can't even express it, but I, I just didn't know what happened. I had no idea what just happened. Here I was with my father's body, but I had no view, to use a Buddhist language about it. I had no view of it at all. Um, I've come to think of this as, as a, one of the most precious moments of my life. Um, I had no view. Uh, it wasn't that I just sort of didn't know in the usual sense. It wasn't that I sort of always, I, I wasn't, it wasn't an analytic question of, oh, it could be this, it could be that. And I know what Buddhism teaches, it teaches rebirth, and I believe in rebirth. Um, more and more as I got older, I, I see no sense in life without rebirth. I see no sense in the Dharma life without rebirth, really. I don't know how one can see that. Um, so I'm open to it. I don't know anything, but I'm, I believe it, and I'm, I'm open to it, and more so as I got older. But in that moment, I had no view, um, including a view of rebirth. 
And that, that no view included that he died in the sense that we use it. Because we think we do know uh, when someone dies. We think, well, they're dead, um, that they were alive. Um, before they were born, there was no life, and now there's no life again. But that's, that's a belief. That's not a knowledge. It's a belief disguised as a fact. And it's a belief that's disguised as a fact in such a way as we can be rather proud of that uh, so-called fact and be rather pleased with our own lack of enchantedness, our own sophistication, our own gritty realism that, you know, when someone's dead, they're just dead. But it's just a belief. It's something we believe. Um, and in that way, we're like uh, Victorian Christians. We're as convinced of our belief in the fact of death as Victorian Christians would believe, were convinced of, their, of the reality of God and of the fact of God. And at one, 200 years ago in England, to question the existence of God would have been like madness. Yeah? And it feels a bit like that for us now, that to question um, death and to say that we might not know even, or even that it might be something quite different than we imagine, seems like a kind of madness. We're a fully inversion, a full inversion now of uh, you know, Victorian England in that way. But yeah, I had this moment where I, I didn't know, I knew I didn't know, and it was a blessed moment. Um, a moment in which life and death, as it were, sounds pretentious, opens up to me, um, opened up to me um, in a, a glorious not knowing. And in that not knowing, all kinds of possibilities were there, but no, nothing was known. Um, I seem to have a, a moment of, the, of, of awareness of the mystery of death. And even that word mystery is mystifying. Um, it, it suggests a sort of wooziness, a sort of smokiness. I don't mean that. It's much better to say I had no view. That would be the Buddhist uh, vision. I had no predisposition one way or another to affirm or reject, to say yes or to say no, or to say maybe. I just... Didn't know, had no view about what was happening. Yeah. Um, and of course, later on, views came back and uh, grief was there and so on. But for a while, I lived in a space of no view. And that's the space that the Buddha lived in all the time. It doesn't mean to say he didn't think. He thought very, very deeply. But he had no view in the sense of no ideology, no pre-theory to experience. He was just completely open to experience and saw through to the depths of it. He didn't have a kind of, um, you know, template to put on experience and shape it and say, oh, I knew it was going to be like that. Because one of the lessons we are trying to learn from the Buddha Dharma is that how you look at something changes your experience of it. How you look at the world creates the world. So if you think of yourself as a kind of complex machine that came into being, and will then just break and, and uh, fall apart. That's how the world will seem to you. And you'll get more and more confirmation of that. You'll, you'll talk to other people who also believe with that. You'll see the world like that. You'll see other people like that. Um, how you look at the world shapes what you see and shapes your experience of seeing. Yeah? Um, that what you've got is view, and view is creating world and it's creating self. Yeah? Um, I remember that, I will come on to the Buddha in a second, um, I, I remember whilst I'm talking, thinking about this, going to a, uh, a funeral, not so many, a few years ago, somebody I interviewed at Poetry East, who, uh, um, Alex Danchez, he, um, wonderful biography, he, he wrote this wonderful biography of Cezanne, which, Cezanne is one of my great heroes, I've written about Cezanne, and, you know, sort of feel of Cezanne as a kind of beloved friend and hero and, of mine. And I remember reading his biography and reading his translation of the letters and so on. So I interviewed him here at Poetry East, and it was like meeting, you know, we both just raved about Satan. <laughs> you know, it was like meeting a friend in a pub to talk about an absent friend and tell all the stories again. It was just, I mean, I don't know whether other people enjoyed it. I had a great time. Um, and, uh, 
And then about two weeks later, I got an email uh, from his wife uh, saying, uh, you know, from, I remember it in the email box saying, uh, Delia Dantes, I think it was, that's very odd to get it. And it, and, um, it just, just, to, just to say that uh, Alex had died. Um, and I, my first thought was, no, he can't have died. It's an email. I thought, this is probably, I thought this is probably a spoof. You know, this is probably a, not a spoof, what do they call it? Um, Slam, flam, whatever it's, you know. <laughs> what is it? Spam. You know, or, or you know, some sort of hoax or I thought I thought it's probably not true. Um, and then I thought, well he can't have died because I was I was in email contact with him just the other day. So you can't have an email from somebody and then they die. That doesn't happen. Again, do you see how that's view? You that that is a view. You can't be in any email correspondence with somebody that dies two days later. That that doesn't happen. It's like you know, the, the, the whole story has to go between that. All that happened, he went cycling, came back and had a huge stroke and died. Um, halfway through a book. And I, I, all I, I, eventually I had to check with his university, is it true? You know, I couldn't, didn't even want to, to answer the email. Anyway, I, I, was, I was in touch with his wife and I just said, look, would it be possible for me to come to the funeral? I felt a real connection with him. Sometimes when you meet someone, even once, you can feel a real connection with them kind of kinship with them, a kind of, like, you know, sometimes you think, I know you, like, partly through Suzanne. I thought, well, we don't even need to be introduced, you know, we're just friends of Suzanne's, we just need to wrap on about that, you know. Um, so I went to his interview, and it was in this, it was in the Ashmolium in, um, in Oxford, uh, terribly posh you know, gallery, and, and everybody was very posh, and I was the only person I thought that wasn't a professor, um, and a few, quite a few people spoke. And it, but it was a secular funeral. And uh, I just thought, this is just not good enough. This is not good enough. You know, um, people spoke and said good things. Uh, but, you know, there, there was, nobody, for instance, referenced the coffin. There was a coffin in the room. Everyone talked about his publishing history and this and that. And there's a coffin in the room, a dead person in the room. And this person was a secular um, Minister, you know, it sounded like Radio 2, you know, um, now we're going to play some jazz. You know, you're not doing it like that, you know. The, the lack of religion was like a harm. Um, I just thought this is not good enough for grown-up people. It really isn't. Unfortunately, ritual and, and, and devotion and all those things have been captured by all kinds of views again, uh, some of them very, very damaging. Um, but without ritual and devotion, we have no uh, approach to the dead. And a culture that has no approach to the dead is in real trouble. Interestingly, I was listening to Auden talking about poetry. He said he thought that poetry is one of the ways of talking to the dead. And that a culture that can't talk to the dead is in real trouble. And I, I think that's a real thing to bear in mind. If we can't talk to the dead, we're in trouble. Uh, so ritual is a, it's a way of talking to the dead. It's a way of bridging that gap. Um, so it's a mystery, and that, that's why rituals are so important, because it's a mystery, because you don't know. Um, because we really don't know, and, it, and we don't know that we don't know. We sort of say we don't know, but we, we, cover, we, we have really a belief that it's the end. Uh, that is effectively a belief. It's an unsecured belief, like the belief in God, creator God, like all sorts of other beliefs. Um, it's just one that most of us, many of us, have grown up with and we take to be a fact. Yeah. So my experience there with my father and that experience of going to see Alex's funeral really, again, confirmed to me that I don't know what death is, that none of us do, that it's a sort of sacred mystery. And if death is a sacred mystery, then life must be a sacred mystery because death shadows life. I remember bursting into tears when I was just about five or something like that, possibly one of my earliest memories. I was watching my mother um, dust she, in, the, in the days before she had to drive coaches, but that's another, another story. Um, I used to follow her around with the polish tin. She used to let me hold the, the tin of polish and I'd follow her around the house. And my brothers were at school and my, my sister wasn't born yet and my mother wasn't having to drive coaches then um, in this brief time when we had a little bit of money, I think. Um, didn't last very long. And I was in, the, she was polishing the, her, the, the, my parents' bedroom and uh, you know, cleaning. I remember her putting the socks in the drawer and all that sort of thing. It was only tiny. And um, I felt so happy to be with her. 
you know, that lovely moment when you have your mother all to yourself. <laughs> so lovely, you know, my brothers wouldn't be back for years, you know, actually about half past three, but um, it felt like I had the whole universe with my mother alone, you know. Um, and I burst into tears because I suddenly had this realization that that must end. Even at that age, I had this realization that that must end. So that life is, all of life is haunted by death and we don't know what death is. Even this word, we, even when you say the word death, you sort of think you know what it is. Um, but we, so we're talking about our life being haunted by something that we don't know what it is. Um, so that makes life into a mystery. And the, the, the person I know of, I know through uh, my teachers is the Buddha, and it's him that's got deepest into that mystery. So we have to join the Buddhist story when he was in his early 80s, and he suddenly became very sick. I won't bother you with the story why, it's all a bit complex, and I've never quite thought it, I think it might be a story, but he got sick. Yeah, he's old, he got sick, um, and he knew he was dying. Um, he just, he knew. He even said to Ananda, who is his friend and companion, he said, um, it's lovely to say, he said, my body is old. He said, I feel like a, an old cart that's been tied together with string and rope. You know, the whole car is falling apart and I'm, I've just sort of had to tie it together and it's a rough ride for me now. So, and the Buddha had quite a lot of physical pain. The, the, in, in, the, in, the su- in the suttas that come down to us, um, he, he asked on and to, to massage him and things like that. And it feels, I think little moments like that feel very believable to me. I can imagine that. And it's interesting that it stayed with us. It's like that moment in King Lear at the end when he says, undo this button. Um, that moment of detail that tells you this is human. Yeah? Um, so he got sick and what he did is he went on a kind of farewell tour uh, um, in the sense of he, he taught new disciples, he taught. He taught the threefold way. He taught, um, he taught going for refuge to the Buddha, Dharma and Sangha. He taught, uh, he's often said that he's taught the path of regular steps, that you need to keep on um, a path of regular steps, taking the next step. And what we've been saying to you just now is you need to take on the next step. Um, and that's what the Buddha taught is a, is a, is a, a path of regular steps. He traveled around with bare feet, a very elderly man, uh, supported by his friend, who Anadu is his cousin, and is often talked about as his companion, but uh, we would just say friend, you know, he's just friend. Um, and uh, the Buddha said to Anandu, um, this is where I'll have my Paranirvana. We came to this place where the elders in the village would meet, which has got like a, a stone bench, a long stone bench, and it was between two trees, come in, it was between two trees, two sal trees, and when he got to this place, he said, um, he said to Ananda, this is, this is where I'll attain Paranirvana. Yeah. This is, for us, we might gloss that for the moment, this is where I'll die, but he doesn't mean die. Um, uh, he said this well, and, and Ananda says, oh no, not here, not here. I mean, this is like, this is like nowhere, you know, it's like Solly Hull. Um, at your Bishop Stortford or somewhere like that. Um, no, you don't want to die in Solly Hull. You know, sorry, if anyone's come from Solly Hull, it's near where I come from. Um, you know, like, you know, I don't know, coming, dying in real or something. Um, you know, some small out of the way place that's unimportant. Um, he says, you know, don't, don't die here. Let's, in other words, let's go somewhere. Let's at least die in some majestical city. Um, and I think this is important in itself. Um, I always find this significant, that any place is the place of in, enlightenment. Uh, it's interesting because the Buddha gained enlightenment on the, the Vedrasana. That's what we call the Vidra, our retreat center after Vedrasana. Vedrasana means really the central place. To, uh, in, in, in Buddhist mythology, it's the first part of the universe that appears and the last part of the universe that disappears. So where he gets in line is the center of the universe. And mythologically, and from the point of view of a uh, um, you know, parable, that's true. Yeah, that's completely true, that the enlightenment is the center of the universe. And so is the parinirvana. Um, 
that becomes the center of the universe. So that can be Solihull, it can be Tooting, where Bante Sangrachita was born. Wherever you come from, uh, you know that you always feel, did you have this when you thought, I really should have come from somewhere, I don't know, better, uh, you know, <laughs> sexier. You know, I wish I was born in New York, or, you know, or if I had an Irish accent, it would be nice. <laughs> I just come from the West Midlands. I mean, whoever, who's come from the West? I haven't even come up from up north. You know, if I'm from Yorkshire, I'd have an accent or, you know, something. And Cornwall would be nice. Um, you know, I'd have that accent from there and probably be a bit more surfy. Um, but I come from this small place in the middle of nowhere called Henley and Arden that, that was once famous for ice cream, but hasn't, that's about it, you know. But, it, but the parent of the Buddha is saying, no, this is, this is where I'm going. Parent of honor is saying that every place is a place where everything can happen. You are the place where the mystery of life unfolds. It doesn't unfold anywhere else. It unfolds in this place for this person. Yeah? There isn't a place that it's, that, that, that's too lowly for that or too, um, I don't know, not spiritual for that. Um, yeah, uh, everything in in life happens for a particular person at a particular place. Yeah, so that that's how I read that. That this place is the place of the Panavaran. It's just like a little tiny village out in the middle of nowhere. And what the the Buddha to be? Well, not the Buddha to be. What the Buddha does is he he lies down on this bench, this stone bench. He lies down in this particular posture that you might have seen in images sometimes, with his, his head on his hand like that and his other arm resting on, on his side. Um, it looks slightly like he's watching television, but <laughs> unfortunately it doesn't quite translate <laughs> for many of us. But it, that, that's him in, in, the, in, in, in the, the posture of Pana Nirvana. Yeah. And um, he, he says to uh, Arnada, you know, call, call everyone. I'm dying now. I'm going to die. This, this is probably the most conscious death that's ever happened. Con um, in, well, it is, from a Buddhist point of view, it's the most conscious death that could be imagined. Um, you wouldn't think it's possible of a human being. So he said, I I'm going to die. Let's call, call everybody. Um, I want them to come. Uh, they might have questions. They might have last concerns. They might, there might be more I can do. It's interesting that he's not thinking about himself. He's thinking about others. What you get with the whole of this story is that he's concerned about others, not just human beings, interestingly, but supernatural beings. Uh, he's concerned about everybody else. He's not in the slightest bit concerned for him. For the Buddha, his paranirvana is a non event. Paranirvana mean, nirvana means enlightenment, pari means without remainder. So you get enlightenment, and you get, par you get nirvana, enlightenment, and you get parinirvana, you, which is enlightenment without a remainder, and the remainder just means the body. Yeah. So the main thing, of course, is the enlightenment. He's now enlightened, and you have enlightenment with a body, and you have enlightenment without a body. Yeah. Uh, so for the Buddha, this is a non-event. Nothing's happening. Nothing important is changing. It's important to everybody else, and he knows that, so he says, bring people, bring, bring all my disciples, bring everybody to, there might be more I can do. And in the story, he even takes a last disciple. Somebody comes, uh, talks to Ananda and says, I, you know, I want to go for refuge. It's always expressed that I want to uh, go for refuge to the Buddha, his Dharma, his teachings and his Sangha. Please admit me into the order. Um, and he, he goes up to Ananda and says, please, I want to see the Buddha and be admitted into the Sangha. And Ananda says, look, this is really not the time. Uh, the Buddha is very, very ill. He's dying. This is not the time. We can't do that now. You can just imagine uh, everyone feeling very protective of him. No, he's just, you know, it's like tonight. And if, if you, you, this is not a good time. Really sorry. Come back in the morning. Um, and uh, the Buddha hears it. And says to Ananda, no, no, bring him, bring him, bring him to me. Um, and he, he admits the, the, the final man into his uh, Sangha, the final person to his, his Sangha. Yeah. Um, so he's very much thinking of others. Um, so you have to imagine this man lying in the very rag robes. Um, uh, just, and the, the, the robes that the, the, the Buddhists wore 
they look very beautiful now, but they were literally rags sewn together and ruined by dipping them in a, a certain kind of mud that makes them go orange, um, you know, makes them go um, saffron sort of colour. But they're, they're basically just like rags that you would have cleaned the floor with, sewn together, dipped in mud. So, you know, this is, it, it's, it's not the glorious golden figure. It's an old man, very ill, very emaciated, wrapped in rags. Yeah, that's literally what it would it, 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 be, be more like seeing a street person in a really bad state yeah, than anything else. Uh, except for there'd be this incredible aura around him. Yeah? And there's this moment even when Ananda looks at uh, the Buddha and it's as if his whole body is golden. And uh, Ananda says to the Buddha, you, you, your whole body looks, you look golden at the moment, you look so beautiful at the moment. And, um, and the Buddha says, yes, this is what happens when a Buddha goes into Parinibbana. They, they seem to become golden. It just sort of this, this is what's happened to all the Buddhas throughout time, and that's what's happening to me now. And then one of the lovely parts of the, 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 the stories I like, and I love this story, just as Don Utah was saying how much he loves the... I could tell this story to the end of time. This is an endless story. All of these stories about the Buddha, they, you know, let's just do it again you know, <laughs> next year. But um, all of the natural world comes as well. So... Monks and nuns, lay people, lay, lay men, lay women, children, they all come, disciples, every, the word gets out, everybody comes over the next days. And according to the story, the animals all come as well. Um, so this is, remember, northern India, so that would include like snakes and, uh, and so on. Um, uh, and of course, this is in the world of parable, but parable touches onto a deeper truth than history, I think. So you've got all of these animals there, um, mice, and traditionally, by the way, cat, the cats were the only animals that didn't cry, um, which has given them a bad press in traditional Buddhism, because uh, everybody else, every, all the other animals cried. I remember telling this story to this group of school children that visited the center once. And I said, I'm going to tell you this story, it's a true story about the Buddha, blah, blah, blah. And I, I said, and guess what animal didn't cry? And someone said, was it the giraffe? I said, no, no, the giraffe cried. Was it the alligator? No, no, the alligator cried. There's this hush. And I said, it was the cat. The cat didn't cry. And there's this fantastic pause. And this little girl said, hang on, animals don't cry. <laughs> <laughs> and I said, uh, no, no, they don't. She said, you said it was a true story. I said, well, it's like symbolically true. <laughs> said, it's a terrible kind of reverse. <laughs> There's this marvellous moment that you, in this incredible voice just came saying, hang on, animals don't cry. <laughs> <laughs> Suddenly, enlightenment had dawned. Um, not only had anim did animals um, gather round, um, but the, the sky filled with devas. Um, the word deva just means being of light. Um, so it's really a, the, the equivalent of our angel, really. Um, uh, they, in the pictures that you see of them, they're not, they, they don't have wings, that's the only difference, really. They're, they're just being, beings of light. Um, also, mud spirits, uh, tree spirits, river spirits, earth spirits, um, the whole universe came to watch the Buddha's Parinirvana. Um, there's even this beautiful moment, again, it's, it, weirdly, it's like a comic moment where the Buddha is lying there, and one of the Buddha's disciples is very concerned and is standing in front of the Buddha, fanning him with a fan, because he's got a temperature, presumably, and he, he's fanning him with a fan. And uh, the Buddha so, you know, moves him out of the way. And everybody there sort of sets out a whisper, saying, well, why is he moving, you know, he's, he's trying to help, why is he moving him out of the way? And Arnada, who's always the task to ask the Buddha things, he says, well, why did you just move the venerable brother out of the way he was trying to help? And the Buddha says, all of these devas have come from all these different universes to see the Paranirvana, and they're complaining, they can't see me. <laughs> this guy is in the way. <laughs> and they're getting a bit like, excuse me? <laughs> get, you know, get the monk out of the way. <laughs> it's like a sort of sweet in comic sort of moment. Anyway. Um, so... And it's a lovely image because it said, it said that throughout the whole sky, there wasn't a single place where you could put a, a hair of a horse, a hair from a horse's tail. 
a single prick in the sky that didn't have an angel or a deva or a god or a, a celestial being in it. So you have to imagine this celestial appearance and all of these animals, you know, mice, voles, snakes, all weeping, to, you know, according to the story. Um, all of these human beings, it really is like going back to the Lord of the Rings, like a scene from Lord of the Rings. Um, and you've got this golden figure at the centre of it, yeah, who is uh, not in the slightest bit frightened of death because nothing's going to happen to him. All he's got is enlightenment without a remainder and enlightenment with a remainder. And he's just going to go from one to the other. It's not a thing for him. So what I take this to mean is that the universe is alive. It's conscious. That This, this is something that we're horribly uh, separated from now but that we live in a living universe. That, and it might even be saying something like that consciousness is primary and that matter is a kind of... Um, well, I, again, I've been talking to Ian McGilchrist. We interviewed him. And he was t- talking in... Is it, he, I interviewed him and Jan of Archer interviewed him. And he, he, was, he was talking of matter as being a kind of... Um, that, that consciousness needs a sort of resistance somehow. That was his theory. That consciousness was primary, but needed sort of a resistance to it to, to make it um, flourish. Yeah? I mean, I, I don't know, I'm way out of my depth, but what the story symbolises in extremely precise poetic language is that the world is conscious, and at the heart of that consciousness is the possibility of enlightened consciousness. That life itself is like a great spiral and it spirals out from enlightened consciousness, as it were, that the possibility of consciousness, more and more or less consciousness, can, as it were, spiral all the way into the highest consciousness of the Buddha. Certainly my own teacher, Sangharachita, that's how he, he said, that's how I see things. I, when I look at life, I see a world of kind of consciousness, not a human consciousness that we would recognise, um, and I'm not trying to be sentimental or um, woo-woo about that. And you, one can be sentimental about these things. And sentimentality doesn't help anyone, I'm afraid. It's, it's really masquerading. It's a kind, people who are sentimental will betray you because it's, um, it's false feeling sentiment. So that's why, um, I don't know, indigna- you can have sentimental indignation. You can have sentimental pity. You can have sentimental love. You can have sentimental feelings about the natural world. Um, because you, and you have those because you think people will admire you for them. You can never have sentimental hatred, you never have sentimental depression, you never have sentimental spite and so on because no one will admire you for it. So um, I'm not trying to sentimentalise uh, the world, but it's saying in some way that I don't understand and that none of us understand is that consciousness may be primary in some way. Um, I mean, I remember, do you remember that, that film, what was it, um, Koi and Eskatsi? It starts with, I think, with this monkey. Now, do you remember it? It starts with this monkey in its frozen um, pond. It's just, with, it's just head above the water. It's a lovely cloak of this monkey. It's got all this frost in its fur. And it's sitting, look, looking at the camera. Of course, it doesn't know it's being filmed. And it's just so vividly conscious. You feel your kinship with it immediately. You, you always expect it to start smoking. You know? um, <laughs> it's so, you know, this monkey is so clearly a kind of consciousness. Um, but Buddhism say, would say that trees and rivers and the earth itself has analogies to consciousness. And that consciousness, it's not the right word because it's, it, it's too human, but it, it, it goes all the way down away into rocks and plants and all the way up through human consciousness to enlightened consciousness. Yeah? At least that's how I understand uh, uh, the Buddhist message. Um, that consciousness, what we call consciousness, which we capture to being human, actually extends right before us and right after us into enlightened consciousness and that it's not destroyed by death um, because you have enlightenment um, uh, nirvana uh, with a remainder and you have nirvana without a remainder you have paranirvana uh, of course I don't know that but that's what it might be saying so there's this figure surrounded by 
the universe, all turning towards the heart of consciousness. Do you see what I mean? I don't know whether I'm getting it across, but um, it's like what all life is trying to do. It's trying to manifest itself. It's trying to fully be itself. So a blade of grass wants the room to be a blade of grass. A, an oak tree wants to open out to its whole oak tree nuts. Um, a slug wants to be that shining, glistering slug leaving a silver trail. Everything wants to fully be itself. The Buddha is the fully being the human self. Yeah, it's, it's what our consciousness wants to do. It wants to, um, like an acorn to an oak tree, as I said before, it wants to fully manifest consciousness. Yeah? Um, that's what life is for. That's what human life is for. And all of the universe is like that. It wants to fully manifest itself. Um, and it wants even to go on to higher levels of manifestation, just as you do and I do. And just as, you know, Oscar, when he, he got his magic wand and was frustrated it didn't work. You see how, I don't know how old you were then, Oscar, as a little boy. But that's right. It's like, no, it should work because I need to go on to a new level of consciousness in which magic can happen. Yeah? So that's how I read that image. And then in the middle of that cosmic drama, you then have to see a, one of the figures of these monks you know, behind the Buddha walking away and weeping. And uh, this is Ananda, uh, the Buddha's friend, who walk, walking off and weeping. And, you know, according to the story, and I, it seems to me it's, it's true, uh, and he just goes away and weeps, and he doesn't want to weep in front of the Buddha. Um, uh, he, he goes away to weep. And the Buddha notices he's not there. Uh, Ananda is the person who traditionally comes down to us as a person who remembered everything the Buddha said. So it's very important for Ananda to be, to be there, not just because he's a friend, but because Ananda is the one who remembers. He had, it seemed to have this, some people do have this memory where they can literally remember everything, and Ananda could. He noticed he wasn't there. And he asked for another uh, disciple to bring Ananda back. And uh, he said, the Buddha says to him, where were you? And he, he's saying, well, I was weeping. Uh, and what, when Ananda went away, what he said to himself, what he kept saying to himself, is I'm going to lose the Buddha, my teacher, he who was so kind. Yeah, he who was so kind. Not he who was so wise, he who taught all this wonderful stuff, but he who was so kind. It's the sort of thing a friend would say. What I remember is his kindness, and I've seen his kindness in infinitely small ways and in large ways, and I've seen it all the time. Kindness, genuine kindness, not sentimental kindness, but genuine kindness, has its own exquisite aura. You feel instinctively attracted to it, just as you do to genuine honesty, uh, just as you do to any genuine virtue and value. You, you don't need to tell yourself, if you're not at least crushed by something or, or I don't know, distracted by your phone for a second, um, you'll feel an instinctive attraction to real virtue. As soon as someone's honest, as soon as someone's kind, genuinely kind, genuinely generous, you feel your heart yearn for that. Yeah. So that's what Ananda, when, when the Buddha was dying, that was the thought that came to him, is he who was so kind. Yeah. And he goes back to the Buddha, uh, and, he's, and uh, the Buddha is exquisitely gentle, and he says, um, Ananda, I've, we've, I've always taught you that everything that comes into being must pass out of being. I've always said that. And I've always said that anyone you're close to, that you're, there's going to be separation. I've always said that. You know, any, you, there will always be separation from anyone near and dear to you. That's, that's what's happening now. I've told you that. Um, remember that. That's what's happening. And then what he does is he rejoices in Ananda, in front of everybody. He says Ananda's, it's all rather codified in the, in, the, in the sutta, but he basically just rejoices in him, and rejoices, I mean Ananda's been his close friend and companion for 40 years, and he just rejoices in him, in front of everyone. So in the middle of this, as it were, cosmic drama, you have this human drama, which is the drama of friendship, you know, and again, going back to the Lord of the Rings, I was so struck how, how friendship is central, fellowship across different races even, you know, and different species, species, races, I don't know what they would be in, in, in Tolkien, but 
fellowships that transcend uh, divisions. Um, and that's what you get in all mythic stories. You get fellowships of virtue and um, love and loyalty. You see that again, don't you, very much in Lord of the Rings, all this loyalty and love of virtue. And this is, this is the highest loyalty and the highest virtue. Um, yeah, so you get that, that happening as well. And, um, and then the Buddha says, there's this great, I imagine this great silence, um, a universal silence. It's almost like the universe holds its breath. You can see the Buddha dying. And um, he says, so you might have questions for me. I've been teaching all this time. He's spent his, the only, re, the, reason, the only reason he didn't sit, carry on sitting at the Bodhi tree for the rest of his life, effectively, is for the welfare of all, is for compassion. He lived for compassion. That's, that's the only, that was, there was no reason to live as an ego because he transcended egotism in his enlightenment. There's no need to live and protect himself, do all the stuff that we just take utterly for granted because he'd seen through all that. He'd seen through that in enlightenment. So the only reason to be was for compassion for all beings. So he says, you might have some last, I'm about to leave you, you might have some last questions for me now. So this is your chance. Ask me things, that, anything that you're not sure about, if you have any doubts about the Buddha, the Dharma or the Sangha, ask me now. Yeah? And then there's this incredible uh, silence, nobody speaking in this huge multitude. And the Buddha says, with I think exquisite, um, courtesy, he says, um, okay, so you might be too shy to ask me. Uh, it's a difficult time for you. You might not be able to do that. <laughs> so why don't you, if you've got any questions, why don't you ask a friend near to you to ask for you? Yeah, Because you might not be able to put your hand up. Uh, you might not be able to step up to that. So why don't you just, if you have a question, ask a friend? Yeah. Um, I'm very struck by this because one translation of sila, which is usually translated as ethics, is um, uh, ethics, sorry, I've just uh, got slightly distracted. It's, um, hmm. uh, it, it's, uh, it, well, it's translated as ethics, but it's also translated as manners, yeah? As manners. And we, we can be quite sort of um, uh, as dismissive of manners. Um, David's filming, and David's got exquisite manners. Um, he's, he's my image of manners. Um, he comes from rural Ireland. All you need to have to have exquisite manners seems to be to come from rural Ireland. Um, but manners, what manners do is they show you, they show people that you're aware of them. That's what manners do. So when you open a door for somebody, it's not that they literally need the door open for them. It, it humanizes, it shows them, I'm aware of your humanity just as it is when somebody comes into the room. Jan of Arch has also got wonderful manners, and he'll be the first to make sure that there's a, chi there's a chair for somebody if there isn't a chair or um, whatever. The, the, the bed is prepared, someone's going to stay. Um, the man manners are to do with being a showing someone that you're aware of them. Um, Bhante Sangrachar, our founder, had exquisite manners. So I remember there, there were some order members from India who come from a very, very poor, very crushingly poor background in India, and they came to have a meal with Bhante. Um, and uh, Bhante is sitting at the head of the table, and they were sitting on the, the left of Bhante. And Bhante said, no, no, they need to be sitting on my right. And he, and he moved them to his right, because that's, that's, that's the place of honour, uh, is the is right, because it's easier to turn to the right. You sit on the right-hand side of God. Um, you know, it's a place of great courtesy. It's more difficult to turn to your left. Yeah? And Bhante was exquisitely aware of that. And these people had come all the way from India to see him. And he wanted them to be in the place of honour so he could talk, turn to them very, very easily. Yeah? It, it's very, very beautiful. It, it, it creates with it this, this beauty. And people respond to it very much. Callum's here. I mean, Callum's only 19. And... Um, He'd written a lit letter to Johan of Archer and said, look, if you have any time, I'm coming around this day. I know you'll be busy. And, he would, and again, Johan of Archer was struck by Callum's manners, his um, courtesy in an email. He didn't say, I'm coming over on this day. 
it'd be good if we met up, you know, which sometimes people do. <laughs> uh, it was very, very courteous. So I'm struck that even the Buddha, right the way there, it's an exquisite kind of courtesy, isn't it? Exquisite manners, which is, a, which is a, a, some of the beauty of what we call rather tediously and sort of rather grandly ethics. Yeah. In a way, manners is sometimes better. So, but nobody answered the question. Uh, nobody, no, nobody had any questions. The Buddha uh, said, um, all compounded things are impermanent with mindfulness strive on. Yeah. So those were his last words. All compounded things are impermanent with mindfulness strive on. I think it's quite possible that these are literally the Buddha's last words. I think if anyone was able to remember anything word for word that the Buddha said, the, the, the story of honour and notwithstanding, it would be these last words. Everybody would want to know what did the Buddha say before he went into power, what was his last words. Even now you have books of last words, don't you? So it's very, very likely, after two and a half thousand years, that these are literally, in, in English, a translation of uh, the, 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 the last words that the Buddha said two and a half thousand years ago. All compounded things are impermanent, with mindfulness strive on. So he's, he's emph- the last words are imp- emphasizing impermanence. So if you want to discover a new consciousness, a Buddha consciousness, you need to go via the path of impermanence. You need to embrace, you need to cherish impermanence. And that's what we're doing tonight. This is the New Year's Eve. It's a good night to talk about that again. Every night is a good night to talk about that. And then if you're going to discover a Buddha consciousness, you need to strive. And the, the word in Pali is very strong. You need to strive. You need to strive like the fellowship of the ring. Strive. Yeah. It's that kind of striving. It's what we would call heroic striving, except for heroic has got a sort of tinge of sort of puffed upness about it very often. It doesn't mean that, but it's got a sort of puffed up chestness about it. It tends to be, tends to be associated with young men and so on. And some young heroes can be a pain in the neck, <laughs> frankly. Um, but it means that kind of heroism. Yeah? It, it means real striving, um, not in a kind of thin, um, pseudo-heroic way, but in a genuine way where you put yourself out for the highest. Yeah? And you keep doing that on a daily basis. You keep meditating, you keep practicing precepts, you keep being honest, you keep being friendly, you keep, you keep trying to work out your reactions and try to work out your tricky mind and so on. That, that's striving. You do that every day. Yeah? And then he emphasizes um, mindfulness. But the word for mindfulness is not the mindfulness that we know of. Um, uh, it, the, 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 the Apamardena is the word. Apamardena is some Pali term. Yeah? And the Pali is Apamardena, which is the Pali for Apramada, which is usually translated as mindfulness, but it's not a very good translation of it. Um, Mada means drunkenness. Yeah, uh, uh, prama, sorry, pramada means drunkenness. So apramada means with the least degree of drunkenness. Yeah. So it, it's saying reflect, you know, really embrace impermanence, strive with the least degree of drunkenness, be as li- as sober as possible. Uh, don't be drunk. And he doesn't. He's using drunkenness obviously as a metaphor, but he means don't be drunk by hatred. Don't be drunk by craving. Don't be drunk by illusion, delusion. Um, be as sober as possible. Um, don't be drunk. Yeah. Uh, so that's a, a metaphysical point that human beings are drunk. They're like drunk people. They do stupid things. They hurt themselves and they hurt e- each other. They do stupid things because they're drunk. And it's interesting that it says with the least amount of drunkenness. It's like saying you're going to be a tiny bit drunk. Um, you're not, going to, you're not going to be able to manage, you're, not, you're probably not going to get to me. Perhaps he's not saying that, but it's interesting, it's the least amount. In other words, it's very, it's very real. It's saying you're, you're going to be really drunk sometimes, but try and really work on that. And it, it particularly means vigilance. Yeah? It's probably better translated as vigilance. So it's that vigilance that, that knows um, I'm about to do that bad thing. I'm about to lose my temper. I'm about to write something horrible on Facebook. I'm about to uh, give an opinion uh, that, that, that storms off an email chain, chain of um, uh, reactions. 
you know, those so easy to do, isn't it? I'm about to send a nasty text message. I'm about to patronize someone. I'm about to feel sorry for myself. Um, he's saying those are all paths of drunkenness. So try and keep, keep really vigilant for that, watching your mind for where it's going into something that you know is not in your interest and you know it's not in other people's interest. Try to be vigilant in that way. Strive to be vigilant in that way. Yeah. And then, according to the tradition, he then goes up and down the dhyanas. Uh, I won't go through all that. He goes into the supra-conscious uh, 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 supra, um, mental states uh, that you can access through meditation. And then from the first dhyana, he then goes into parinirvana, about which nothing is known. Uh, but I want to um, finish with a f- this final image. So um, he's, he's lying between these twin sal trees, um, and they're beautiful trees. That, I mean, I've never been to India. It's, I really ought to. They're very, t- lot, very tall and thin. And... Um, they, they, they burst, at the moment of the Buddha's death, they burst into untimely blossom. Um, they come into blossom, and there's this rain of blossom from these trees falling on the Buddha. So you, you have to imagine this sort of cosmic scene of this golden figure that's become golden in this mis- mysterious way, surrounded by all sorts of people and then then even things, you know, traditionally it would be demons and gods and spirits and uh, rakshas and kumbandas and all these traditional demonic spirits and you'd have all of these animals, you know, all this huge array in absolute silence, the, the, the heavens full of angels and um, this falling, this, in this silence, just this, the sound of these petals uh, falling on, on the Buddha's uh, Parinirvana, I can't even say his body, and the Buddha's Parinirvana, it's not the Buddha's body anymore. It was never his body, just as my body has never been mine. I've, it's on loan to me. Um, my hands are very like my father's hands. When I, when I cough, I sound just like my dad. It, it's on loan to me, and your body's on loan to you, and you've forgotten that it's, it's on loan. You think you own it, but one day you have to give it back. It's like having a library book, which you've forgotten that it's a library book and you keep it in your shelf and you, you rather like it. But you, you, on the back of your mind, you know that you're going to have to send that back at some point. So the, 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 the petals are falling on the, on, the, on, on the Parinirvana. And I always, somehow that, that image says everything, doesn't it? Because it's, it's also saying that we're in this universe of consciousness, but it's also saying that... Um, Time is an illusion. That whatever's happening here is beyond time. Just as you remember when you had the rose track apple tree, the, the shadow never moved across uh, above the eight-year-old boy. It's another image that, of timelessness, that we're now in an experience that is outside of space, and outside of time. And that's what enlightenment is. It's an experience beyond the physical senses, beyond the rational mind, beyond space and time. It doesn't happen in space and time. Um, but it's a, for me, a one, and I'll close with this, it's a, wonderful, it's a wonderful reflection, isn't it, of the Enlightenment. Because Dolly Yitar brought this out beautifully in her talk um, of all the Mara's armies around the Buddha throwing all those javelins and you know, they're, they're spewing out fire and venomous snakes and throwing all these um, mount, burning mountains and, and they're all turning into blossom. So that's an image of, of, of violence, and human violence is as deep, human malevolence is one of the most terrifying things in the world. It's one of the, one of the things that I hope none of us have to face, but we all have it, that human malevolence. So it's an image of human malevolence being transformed into decorations, as Donna Utah said, for the Tree of Enlightenment. But you see, in this image, there's nothing to transform. So there's just the falling petals, there's, the Buddha's enlightened. There's nothing to transform anymore. There's no, there's no fire. There's, no, there's nothing to transform. There's just a rain of petals in this incredible peace. And in, and in that peace, what it affirms is that at the heart of all of our life is the deepest mystery. And that we can't see where 
where we can't see from there. We can't see where the Buddha goes from there and whether goes is, and goes is metaphoric. When my father died, to go back to that, all I definitely knew was I couldn't talk to him anymore. I couldn't say, oh, hello, Dad. And he said, I'll give you, I'll pass you on to your mother. And she's like, <laughs> so, and then he'd ask my mother, what, what did he say about that? <laughs> oh, I'll pass you on to your mom. Um, uh, all I knew is I couldn't talk to him anymore. Yeah? Um, I, did, I had no view about what had happened. I just knew that I couldn't shake his hand anymore and I couldn't talk to him anymore. And that's a mystery that runs all the way through our life. And you see now the Buddha stepped right into that mystery. And, and it's a mystery beyond that mystery, the mystery of Parinibbana itself. So let's, let, let's finish there. Okay, so we're going to, I think, have a silent break now. This is our...